my, my horrible confession is that I listen to um, Don't Rain On My Parade by Barbara Streisand like, <laughs> like every day. The difficulty is trying not to do sort of Billy Elliot leaps as you're running, imagining you're in a musical. <laughs> I mean, obviously you're a defence barrister. Yes. Which, you know, most people would think that's probably enough for one person. Um, but then you've decided to set up another business. Yes. So, yeah, Ivy and Normanton, which is the first legal outfitters specifically dedicated to court wear for women. Yeah. Um, and I started it when I was a pupil really uh, in 2016 um, and I suppose then when you're a pupil everything's new and you don't you know everything you're doing is overwhelming so I think I get I think I had that sort of that that sort of actor's mindset when they say can you ride a horse uh, and sword fight and then you say yes and work out how to do it later <laughs> So when this arrived, I thought, well, I don't know what I'm doing in any sphere of my life at the moment. So I'll just take this on and then work it out later. And um, it's, it's sort of launched now, uh, about four years later, and um, it's always very exciting. <laughs> it really is so exciting. I mean, you know, you've been kind of um, held out to be doing something really quite innovative and groundbreaking um, because you're the first you're the first person that's really tried to solve the problem that court wear is not designed for women. No, it's it's designed primarily for for male bodies. I mean, there are there there is court wear for women. It does exist, but a lot of the design behind it hasn't changed for so many years. And when you think about how fashion has developed, mm -hmm. it, it hasn't kept up with that because it, it is a product that has remained the same over many years. And you, and you look at the stuff we wore way back in the day, 100 years ago when women first joined the bar, it hasn't really changed, but that's not a reason why we can't now try and update the product and make it suit us better. And, that, and that's what, I'm trying to do uh, and des and solve design problems and issues that we've been griping about for years in the roving rooms and no one's really done anything about. So I mean what's what has been the primary problem then is it is it kind of fit and practicality or is it um, a complete lack of style? It, there's a few issues and I think that the first one that really got me started was was the shirts because I remember I thought to myself I don't just want to wear a velcro bib I want to wear the shirt the men wear the shirt that's the proper thing to wear I want to wear a shirt but then when I tried one on I remember it sort of fit like my my old school uniform did you know when you've got those sort of baggy sides and it didn't properly stretch and I was told I had like two to choose from and it just didn't feel fair that that was all there was and um while i've been in the robing rooms um with other barristers we've been we've been wearing bibs and collarettes and so many people complain about velcro and their hair getting caught in the back of the velcro because it's a, this sort of a tight product that goes up to the top of your neck um and so many people were safety pinning their their bibs into their like into their suits just to keep them from riding up and it just occurred to me that you know we're bit this is ridiculous we're grown-ups we shouldn't have to be safety pinning stuff or fishing clumps of hair out of velcro or wearing school shirts my family has been in the clothing business for a very long time um and i i took one of everything every shirt collar at bib that I could find um to my dad and his designers and just said these well first I had to introduce them to the garments because I'd never seen anything like this before and then I had to sort of explain to them what was wrong with them and then I and then I came up with designs that 
over time we worked out how to how to make things better so now for example my shirt fits a woman's body much better it's it's designed for curves it's got some stretch in it so if you've got a bit of bust or when you're rushing around because your day doesn't just start and finish in court you've got you know running into chambers in the morning to pick up your your papers and whatever and then you've got tesco's on the way home and then you've got you know the court you know tube and all that sort of thing so it it's designed to fit your body and to move with you to be more comfortable men's tunic shirts allow them to be worn like normal shirts as well with a collar but women's women have never had day collars so that they look like normal shirts so I created a day collar and a wing collar so that your shirt can transform from a wing collar shirt to a tunic shirt to a day shirt and we created and we, we put like pins on the top of the bibs and ties on the sides so 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 it's it's so much more convenient and then just made them look a bit different so there's a little bit more zhuzh if i can put it that way like some more interesting lace than just bloody flowers or plain not everyone wants to wear flowers in court when trying to be a serious business person so how much zhuzh are you allowed in a courtroom well i i spent some time like looking looking into this and i couldn't see any specific rules Mm. um saying you know what you should wear or what the lace should look like. I think the point is to, to look professional, to always be professional, but there is some, some room in that. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I note, for example, that, you know, men's shirts would come in different colors, but women's would only come in white. Why do you think that it's taken so long for this to be properly identified as an issue and, and for a, a solution to be created? I think it's either a problem that others didn't see or if they saw it, they either didn't have the means to deal with it or they didn't want to fix it. And I think that a lot of the people who it affects, i.e., you know, funeral court advocates, judges, clerks, you know, solicitor advocates, they're so busy, they don't necessarily have the energy to dedicate to something like this um but it's you know men's wear being a default in any profession where there is a uniform is not unique to the courts and the bar it's an issue that affects other professions so for example my sister's a chef and has a devil of a time trying to find um, a chef's jacket that fits her body yeah yeah um, I've been contacted by um, by priests, female priests, saying, "Can you can you make these in black so that we can wear them?" Wow! You know, I've even heard of, of of female cricketers now developing pads that fit women's bodies. I mean, it. I think this is a, a prevalent problem that exists when there is a profession that is traditionally male dominated, and women have entered later. Yeah. There's a series of problems that you're going to have whenever one one group has hegemony and then another joins later. There are a series of adjustments that need to be made and there will be incremental changes that will happen over time. And certainly court wear is not the biggest problem that women face at the bar um, or or in in the court system it's not the biggest problem but it is representative of our move towards greater equality in in this profession and and that's the way that I saw it because I I do think that clothes are important what we wear is important um you know I can go on a bit of a soapbox on this but if, if you look through history I mean Clothing is political. In, in the 1960s, you know, women burn their bras, they burn their curlers, they burn their high heels because they were representative of, you know, male oppression. When the Shah, you know, the Shah in Iran got, wanted to ban head covering for women. When they got rid of the Shah, they tried to enforce head covering for women. Madeleine Albright was a diplomat who wore brooches as, you know, part of her diplomatic tactics what we wear is significant and when you have a uniform 
it represents that you are part of a club that you that you have either joined that club or you've earned the right to be in that club and it's not good enough then for one one group who joins that club late to to, to not have the same sort of signifiers of that status or, or to feel lesser in any way yeah. to me it's important that we we look as good as as a more prevalent group as as our male peers we should be it's it's not good enough that we don't and that's presumably what's driven you to to do this i mean you got to kind of said that you know, people have recognized this problem but but nobody's really had the oomph to get up and do something about it um is that what's really driving you with this? When I joined the bar, it took me a while to get pupillage. So I didn't get one to get it straight away. And then when I got it, I was like, I've arrived. You know, this is amazing. It, it did sort of occur to me that there was something a little off. So there were more, more senior men than women. All, all the pictures on the walls in the inn and in the courts were, were mainly male barristers most of the judges, most of the clerks in the courtroom. It, it's a very male, quite a male dominated environment, but women do exist. And I can't, I couldn't change the size of the robing rooms to make them the same size. And I couldn't change demographics overnight. But courtware was something that I had the power to do. That became my project. You've launched now, and obviously it's been a project um, for quite some time now. So how's it going? And, and have you had any resistance to it at all? Generally, the reception has been really good, especially from, from other women. I'd say maybe there's a lack of understanding. A lot of people didn't realise that there was any issue. And I don't mean to set this up as a kind of attack on what existed before in any way, because it's not. When, when you're in a supermarket, you may be able to buy bread, but that doesn't make it a bakery. Like this is you know, this is a bakery, this is a, a company that is just dedicated to courtware for women by women. And it's just a very, a very female centered project. It's gone really well. We've had a lot of interest from people and a lot of, a lot of people from all over the UK. And, and we've had some international interest as well from Australia and New Zealand, Hong Kong, even the odd American, which is strange, but um, yeah, so it's, it's but everyone's welcome. So that's been great. And so, it, is it a, is this a global problem then? I've, I did I did research when I was when I was looking into starting this business, and it, it could well be the the British common law system was exported throughout the world because of the British Empire, and we set up a lot of systems that are followed by other jurisdictions so there are real similarities in the in the court where that's worn in other jurisdictions i've yet to find an outfitter that is as female centered as ours and i i haven't i admit spoken to many of my colleagues in the commonwealth to see what their issues are but as i say i haven't seen anyone who's tried to tackle the problem uh, to, 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 try and, to try and focus on women and women's bodies in this niche area as much as we have. So, I, I mean, what's next? Are you, are you, do you think you're going to expand your product line or your range and try and push the boundaries a little bit in, in terms of sort of what people are wearing in court? We're really listening to, to feedback on what we've produced so far and how we can make what we've produced so far as good as it can be and then my, my goals are to, to keep listening at what the other problems are um, and then to expand accordingly to that what I've really enjoyed as part of this project is engaging so much with other women who go to court and hearing from them what they need and I'd like to be able to to respond to that i think i mean i think it's really exciting i think what you're doing is is incredible you know as a as a solicitor i've certainly come across my you know my i've got my had my own experiences of gender inequality in the industry and how yeah. it kind of plays out as a 
as a lawyer in a private practice law firm. Um, but obviously this problem is unique to barristers. We don't have, have uniforms. Um, so I, th I think it's fascinating. And I think it's so inspirational that you, that you saw a problem and, and decided that you were going to do something about it. It's, it's not just barristers in the sense that court solicitors with higher rights, I think they, they, also, they get left out um, and not everyone always remembers them, but there's them too and, and court clerks and judges. Yeah, I'd love to see some really nice dapper ladies in the Supreme Court, you know. Um, Is that the ultimate goal? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, you why not? Love to wear your, um, I mean, I suppose if you were targeting an influencer, who would it be? <laughs> I mean, you know, Lady Hale and that that that's that spider brooch. I mean, that's iconic, <laughs> isn't it? I know. I thought you I might know. say her. Yeah. I know there are a lot of spider brooches about. You sent her a freebie. <laughs> oh, I might well do. I might, or a heavy discount. You know. <laughs> I think women are racked with self-doubt and they and they hesitate a lot before before embarking on big projects and I think it's a constant effort to stay motivated and not to to just say oh forget about it do you do you find that yeah I mean I, th I think it's a confidence issue as much as anything isn't it and, and having the confidence to actually believe in yourself that you can make a difference as well yeah is quite unique and I would really really like to help inspire other women to find that confidence to be able to speak out and and do the kind of things that you're doing where does it where does your confidence come from I mean I think it's definitely grown over time I think once you kind of take that jump and you realize that you haven't fallen flat on your face then it kind yeah. of it builds over time so almost that first leap is the scariest leap but I think I just always had this kind of almost blind belief in myself and this determination to prove people wrong. But I mean, you know, you can create a bit of a rod for your own back as well sometimes. And you might be finding this is when you're kind of trying to tackle all the problems of the world, you end up with a rather long to-do list. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. I suppose I just thought to myself, you know, well, why, why not me? If they can do it, why not me it's it's like what you say when when people ir like doubt you you sort of you can either internalize that in a negative way or use it in a really positive way you're not going to be giving that work up anytime soon you're going to be both businesses <laughs> alongside each other no 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 i mean women have been multitasking for years oh, i mean yeah so I'll, I'll carry on multitasking as long as i can i was I was making a moussaka and like on a conference call the other day, like <laughs> and you, just, you sort of right now I'm writing a brief, you know, just as we talk, but, you know, it's, you just do what you can as, as much as you can. And just, you, know, you just try and be kind to yourself and do the best you can is, is all I, is all I can really ever recommend. And how are you kind to yourself? What you said before, when you said, um, you know, as you've gotten older, you've, you've got more confidence. I think when I was young, when I was younger, every failure, everything that I shot for and maybe didn't get felt so much more, felt so much bigger because it seemed to reflect so much more. With people who I advise about pupillage, for example, I say, don't tie your self-esteem to this process because it's not about that. I think the way you're kind of kind to yourself is just understanding that some days you will be utterly efficient and you will get everything you wanted done but most days you probably won't manage everything and if and sometimes finished is better than than perfect because you you won't always be perfect in absolutely everything that you attempt to do yeah but you will get better and faster over time. And I think it's just having the patience with yourself and treating yourself like you would do a friend who you care about. I think we all need to be kind to ourselves. Other people are gonna be mean to you. You might as well be like kind to yourself, right? <laughs> 100%. Well, I won't take up any of your time. You've got a brief to write after all. <laughs> but honestly, it's been so lovely chatting to you and I think I could chat to you all day long. Mm -hmm.